Okay, so today's video, we're going to focus on the male reproductive system. So let's go ahead and get started. So when we look at the reproductive system in general, male and female, are the, these are the organs and the glands that produce hormones which help to create a new human like we see in the picture here of the ultrasound. And so around the age of puberty, now puberty might, the exact age of puberty could be different for everybody, but let's just say it's around age 12, age 13. This is where we start to develop our sexual maturity, our ability to reproduce. And the reason for the picture here showing a few glands of the endocrine system is because when we reach the milestone of puberty, the hypothalamus and the pituitary glands begin to release hormones by the name of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. From now on, I'm really gonna just call these FSH and LH. These are the two hormones that really jumpstart uh, the process of puberty and sexual maturation. So now when we focus on the male reproductive system, you know, the function or the purpose of the male reproductive system is to produce sperm and then deliver the sperm to the female egg through sexual intercourse. So if we're going to focus on the production of sperm here, we, we have to mention the testes. The testes are the male reproductive organs that actually produce the sperm. They're housed outside the body in a protective layer of skin called the scrotum. When I say they're housed outside the body, what I mean is they're not internal. They're not stored internally in our core. And there's a reason for this. With the testes remaining outside the main core of the body, it keeps the testes a few degrees cooler if the testes were actually pulled up internally into the core of the body, it would be too warm, you know, 98.6 degrees. And that extra warmth would, uh, would prevent sperm cells from being made. So when we focus more on the testes, we mentioned earlier that during puberty, a couple hormones called FSH and LH are released from the pituitary gland. Those hormones travel through the blood down to the testes. These hormones then stimulate the testes to produce testosterone. And this is the reason why we see these, uh, these effects during the puberty years, is because FSH and LH are really first released during those puberty years. And then ultimately testosterone uh, helps to develop the male sexual characteristics and ultimately helps to helps the testes to produce sperm. Now here are some of those male sexual features that uh, that that is stimulated by testosterone. You know, earlier in the school year, you might remember we discussed a process called spermatogenesis, and this topic came up while we were talking about meiosis. Near the end of meiosis in men is when spermatogenesis takes place to produce sperm cells. And this is the location of this are the male testes. So in the male testes, there are diploid cells called spermatogonium. Spermatogonium is singular, spermatogonia is plural. So guys have millions and millions of spermatogonia. And through the process of meiosis, that one spermatogonium will divide into two cells. And then during the second process of meiosis, meiosis two, those two cells will divide into four haploid cells. And spermatogenesis is what happens after meiosis number two is completed. Following meiosis number two, those four haploid cells will go through a, a, a few final biochemical changes that to eventually become sperm cells. And ultimately, uh, it, sperm cells are haploid where half the total number of chromosomes are contained. So spermatogenesis is really, we have to remember this topic from earlier in the school year, is a really important process in the creation of sperm cells that takes place in the male testes. So when we focus specifically on sperm cells, they are created in the testes. You can see I've just labeled testes in the diagram. But after they're created in the testes, they then travel and are stored in the epididymis where they go through a final maturation process. The epididymis is a piece of tissue located on the backside of each testicle. 
A few moments ago, we mentioned that sperm cells are haploid. That again means they have 23 chromosomes. When you look in this karyotype here, you can see 23 chromosomes. But there's, it's haploid. You only see one chromosome 3, one chromosome 10, one chromosome 18. So haploid cells contain 23 chromosomes, but the first 22 are what we call autosomes. You might remember from earlier in the school year, we said autosomes are chromosomes that do not influence sexual gender. And also you'll only find in a sperm cell a single sex chromosome. A sperm cell will either have a single X chromosome or a single Y chromosome. If a sperm cell with a single X chromosome fertilizes the egg, the child will ultimately be a girl. If a sperm cell with a single Y chromosome fertilizes the egg, then the child will ultimately be a boy. Sperm cells contain several parts. You can see them labeled nicely in this picture. There's the head, and at the tip of the head is, what we, uh, is what, where we find what's called an acrosome. It's a pouch of enzymes, and when the sperm cell encounters the egg, the acrosome will release enzymes to help dissolve and break through the outer membrane of the egg so the sperm can then enter and, and finish the process of fertilization. Well, you might know that sperm cells swim, and swimming requires a whole lot of energy. And in the mid piece is where we find a whole lot of mitochondria. Mitochondria, you might remember, are the organelles that produce ATP through the process of cellular respiration. ATP is the cellular molecule used to make uh, used for energy in cells. So the mitochondria are concentrated in the mid piece, producing a lot of energy. And that energy is used to help the sperm cell swim. The sperm cell has a single flagellum, and when this, the flagellum whips back and forth, that propels the sperm cell uh, through the female reproductive system order, in order to find and fertilize an egg. You know, here's a fun little, uh, fun little historical myth here, is that for, for a time period, we, we thought that tiny humans were once to be found inside of sperm cells. So I want to focus now on the prostate gland, another part of the male reproductive system. The prostate gland helps to produce a fluid to nourish and protect the sperm cells, protection from the acidic environment of the female vagina as the sperm cells you know, swim in their process of fertilization. And so during the process of ejaculation, semen is released from the male into the female reproductive system. And semen is a mixture of the sperm cells plus fluid from the prostate gland and fluid from a few other glands as well. Uh, as we mentioned the prostate gland, I do want to mention that prostate cancer is the most common form of cancer in men. And so when you reach a certain age, usually in your 40s, you may start to have regular prostate examinations. And you can, you can see from the picture that um, a, a doctor is reaching up through the rectum and feeling for growths that may appear on the prostate gland. You can see here's a picture of a normal prostate gland, and side by side, here's a picture of an enlarged prostate gland. And so through you know, yearly or every other year uh, examinations, hopefully a doctor can catch and, and identify if there is an enlarged prostate gland, then you can start treatment. The good news about prostate, uh, prostate cancer is that it's usually slow growing, so if it's caught at an early enough stage, then, uh, then treatment can begin much sooner and your, your likelihood of recovery is, is greater. And so when it comes to not just prostate cancer, but cancer in general, there's really three forms of treatment. You can see this person is being prepped for radiation treatment. This person is receiving chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is really the injection of drugs, chemical drugs, into the bloodstream to hopefully kill the, uh, the, the cancer cells. And then there's also the surgical process where a, sur a surgery might be needed to simply remove the cancerous growth. And so as we now focus on the process of fertilization, 
remember that this is where the fusion of the egg and sperm occurs in order to create a zygote. You know, here's a female egg cell with 23 chromosomes in the blue nucleus, and here come a bunch of sperm cells from the male. Only one sperm cell is going to actually penetrate the egg to create a diploid zygote. All the other sperm cells eventually die. And so here's a wonderful picture here of fertilization about to happen. The sperm cell is about to break through the membrane, the membrane of the egg cell. And so when we focus on the pathway that sperm travels in order to, for fertilization to occur is right here. Sperm cells are stored and housed in the epididymis. And then they travel through a tube called the vas deferens and then through another tube called the urethra. So if we focus in the picture right now, the black dots are showing the path that sperm travels from the epididymis through the vas deferens. And as the sperm cells travel through the prostate, they then pick up the, the fluids to nourish and protect them. And then ultimately the sperm cells, and at this point we can say the semen, the semen exits through the urethra into the female reproductive system. And ultimately, uh, depending on the person, uh, depending on the male, 50 to 500 million sperm cells are typically released at each single ejaculation. You know, all it takes is one sperm to fertilize one egg. We've seen this picture a few times now. And here we see a sperm cell about to penetrate the outer membrane and fertilize an egg cell. Let's not forget that in the head of that sperm cell is a pouch of enzymes called the acrosome. Those enzymes will help to break through and penetrate the outer membrane of the egg cell. And so what prevents more than one sperm cell from penetrating the egg? Well, the moment a sperm cell in, uh, penetrates the egg, an instant biochemical change will occur to the outer membrane of the female egg cell, basically making it impenetrable to other sperms. This prevents more than one set of DNA from, uh, let's say, two or three or four different sperm cells from entering and trying to fertilize with the female egg cell. And so there you have, hopefully, a, a good introduction of the male reproductive system. You know, if you're in my biology class, pause the video, try to answer these questions. I'd be happy to check your answers for accuracy either before class or after class. Go ahead and pause the video. Good luck.